on today's Story Beat. To me, the most exciting and important thing about theater is the visceral connection between performer and audience and how we can watch a story unfold on stage and audiences can really lose themselves in that story. And that connection between performer and audience, I feel is truly unique to theater. And why I honestly believe theater still exists in 2021 is because you can't find that anywhere else. You can't find that in film. This is Story Beat with Steve Cuton, a podcast for the creative mind. Storybeat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuton. Thanks for joining us on Story Beat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My guest today, Lindsay Jones, is a Tony-nominated composer and sound designer for theater and film. He's worked extensively on Broadway, off-Broadway, internationally, and on over 500 productions in regional theaters across America. In addition to his two Tony nominations for his score and sound design for Slave Play, which was produced by a favorite Story Beat guest, Jamie DeRoy, Lindsay has received seven Joseph Jefferson Awards and 24 nominations, two Ovation Awards and three nominations for Drama Desk and Helen Hayes Awards, as well as many others. Lindsay's also scored over 40 films, including A Note of Triumph for HBO Films, which received the 2006 Academy Award for Best Documentary. He's the co-founder of the Collaborator Party, and in 2018, he and John Gramada received a special citation from USITT for their advocacy on behalf of theater workers. Lindsay is also a founding member of Theatrical Sound Designers and Composers Association and has been co-chair of its executive board since its inception in 2015. He's currently on the faculty of his alma mater, the University of North Carolina School of the Arts, where he teaches composition for theater and music history. Please be sure to stick around at the end of the show for a real treat. Lindsay has graciously lent us one of his compositions from his work on the Tony-nominated Slave Play. For those reasons and so many more, it's a great honor for me to welcome to Storybeat one of the best theater composers and sound designers working today, Lindsay Jones. Lindsay, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. So let's go back in time and talk about your history just a little bit. Where did your love of music and composing and then sound in general, where did that start? Wow. My love of music began I think at the very beginning of my life, I just uh, was uh, really fascinated by music and sound from a very early age. Um, my father was a collector of uh, jazz records. And so mm. he would have hundreds of jazz records around our living room. And I would literally just um, pull them out one album at a time, put it on the turntable and read the liner notes while listening to the music. And that's really where I became obsessed with music. The very first 45 I ever owned was uh, Do the Mashed Potatoes by James Brown. <laughs> yeah. And I could listen to that for hours. I just, I, you, I you wore like, out the vinyl. Yeah, I did. I felt like someone was speaking to me from another planet. And, mm. um, and well, it was he, so well, exciting James and Brown, inspirational. James Brown might've been speaking to you from another planet. <laughs> You're not sure. You never know. Um, but that's really uh, how I, uh, became interested in it was just, I, I have a calling to it and I remain um, fascinated by it to this day. It's uh, something I, you know, I'm not classically trained in any way. I've never had any formal music lessons of any kind. Really? Um, yeah, not, nothing at all. I just, um, I've always been self-taught. So, um, so you just, is, what, what did you first learn on a guitar? Um, well, my first instrument was a bass guitar. Um, I started playing bass and then um, I've sort of moved into playing things on piano. And now, thankfully, I can do a lot of stuff on computers. Are so. you able to read music? No, not really. You can't read music. So it's all by ear. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's yeah. fascinating to me. <laughs> Does that freak people out when you start working with them and they can't read the music? It does freak people out, actually. Yeah. And I have to sort of walk through it with them. And I, I, there is, 
and usually when I'm working with a new set of musicians for the first time, there is like that period. And I've just gotten completely used to it now where I have to be like, I have to sit them down and explain to them like, okay, I can't read music. This is what I can do. This is what I need you to do. And we sort of, there's this usually like about a 10 minute period where I slowly get people comfortable with the fact that I'm not going to be able to. So, so I, I, I... I'm just curious, how do you then express to them which notes to play? Do you play it so they listen to it? So my process has changed over time in how I handle that. In the beginning, when I first started working as a composer and sound designer, um, what I would literally do would be to sit each musician down and I would sing to them what (laughs) I wanted them to play. Wow. And they would play it back to me. And then I would take all all those things, put it in a computer and sequence it together. And then it'd be done. Um, over time, as I've gotten more and more facile, what I now do is I basically make demo versions of everything in advance um, using all of the instrumentation. So I create the, create the entire orchestration inside of the computer. Then I print each one of those things out as stems. I usually have someone who helps sort of transcribe what that music is, and they turn it into sheet music and give it to a musician. So, so you're playing it into the computer. The computer is printing out uh, notes on in some form of uh, bars. and and then someone else who actually knows better than you what it looks like is making sure that it's right. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. And then someone even better than that plays it and makes it sound like I'm a genius. So like, it's actually perfect um, because I'm not, I'm not a great musician really, but what I'm really, really good at is conceptualizing music. And I like to, um, you know, most people who learn music in a traditional way, They learn it very much from the outside in, which is that they learn the theory, they learn um, the sort of steps of it, and they slowly integrate that into their artistic expression. And that's their life as a musician. I've done the opposite of that. What I've done is I've spent my entire life trying to osmosis as much music into my body as possible by listening. From I'm coming from a, a, a sort of like this omnivore uh of consuming music and integrating it into myself and then from there i visualize that music and push it out of me and turn and have other people help me fit it into what are the structural components of how music works so i want the listeners to to understand what they're hearing here which is i think fascinating um the secret to Lindsay's success is to get people who know things better than him to make him sound even better than he thinks he is. Absolutely. And and I've got news for you as a writer. That's exactly what we do in the theater and in movies and TV is we write things and we think it sounds good in our heads. And then other people called actors and directors and designers and so on come along and make it even better than you thought it was. And Definitely. That's the secret to success is to get people who will take your work and plus it. Um, <laughs> I, I, I've been plussed my whole life, so I totally get it. I think it's really great. So you're completely untrained, no schooling of any kind. No, nothing. In fact, I, I'm now teaching classes in composition for theater and in I'm teaching a music history class this semester. Um, and so it's kind of really amazing because when I was first asked to do that by the school, um, they were like, can you teach your composition process? And I'm like, well, I have to warn you, my composition process is nothing like anybody (laughs) ever teaches. And they were like, they were like, yeah, but the sort of your proof of your work shows that you know what you're doing. So teach your, teach your concepts of how you know how to do it and it'll be fine. And clearly, clearly your degree is not in music. Oh no, not at all. My degree is in acting. I have a BFA in acting actually. (laughs) so okay i should i should back up and tell you this so right so what happened was when i was younger i wanted to be uh, a musician and i wanted to be an actor and so i uh worked at local community theaters where i grew up in winston salem north carolina and i went to the north carolina school of the arts as it was known then and i got a bfa in acting i went and did acting training and everything and then after that was done i moved to Chicago um, to work as an actor and a musician there. And while I was working in Chicago, I had a friend say to me, um, hey, we're doing this show that needs a lot of loud rock music in it. And I had been playing in rock bands for that time. They said, would you be willing to put forward the music for this this show? 
And I said, sure. And they said, oh, by the way, you'll also have to do the sound design. Is that okay if you do that too? And I, I didn't know what that was, but I was like, uh, sure, I'll do that. So and once so, again, an untrained person taking on a job. Just walking in. Um, and so what happened is I wound up doing the show and the show was very successful and it ran for about nine months in Chicago. And so as a result, I had people who came and said, hey, would you be willing to create the music and sound design for our show? And I thought, well, I'll just do this until the jobs dry up <laughs> and then I'll go back to acting. And that was over 25 years ago. I've been <laughs> doing it ever since. You and fell you fell into it. Completely by accident. My entire uh, path was that I was supposed to be an actor. And instead I have lucked into this job of being a composer and sound designer. And it's gone from being this thing I do occasionally to my part-time job, to my full-time job. And now I'm lucky enough to travel all over the country. Well, and, well, Lindsay, yeah. let's get real. Uh, you are acting your way through these things that are not acting. You're you're making your way by creating imaginatively. This is how this operates, even though you've had no structured or academic training in it. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, I think what it comes down to is that I really rely on my own artistic instincts. Mm -hmm. um, I really much, and I think that my acting training, to be completely honest, has made me a much, much better composer. Because How so? One, How so? Well, uh, because one of the things I think that is um, most important in my job is that I frequently have to marry music to drama. And you have to have a really good understanding of what the emotional tenor is of a scene so that the music is accurate to that moment so that you're not being distracting. You're actually supporting the acting that you're creating music for. So I use my acting training constantly to sort of really try to break down acting scenes and figure out, okay, what's trying to be said here? What are the emotions in this scene? How can I support it with music? And so I'm following sort of this emotional instinct to create this musical context around um, these acting scenes to make it feel complete and supported. So that's, that's pretty much how I do it. At the end of the day, you're hitting on what I think is the most important thing for people in the performance arts to understand is that we don't sell um, intellectual stuff. We don't sell academia. We sell passion and emotion. And what you're saying is, is you're tapping into emotions, which is exactly what the audience is seeking when it comes into a theater. That's right. It's really true. It, it, well, it, it truly is true. Do you have a preference in working, whether you'd rather work in the theater or on a motion picture or a TV show? Do you have a preference? I like them both. Um, I, I mean, I will say that at the moment, most of my work is in theater, which is ironic because, of course, we're now in the middle of a pandemic where theater does not exist. <laughs> yes. But um, but I, I, they're, they're really two different skills. And... Um, in, in theater, I create music and I do sound design for theater, but in film, I only do music. I don't do uh, sound design for film. And right. The reason why that is, is because in film, when you're working in sound design, most of the time, what you are trying to do is create verisimilitude. In other words, if you're looking on the screen, right, and you see the image of a key going in a lock, the key turning inside the lock and then the door opening. Mm -hmm. What I'm going to do as a sound designer is my job is to provide those exact sounds so that it's the sound of a key going in lock, the sound of a key turning in lock, the sound of the door opening. I'm trying to find those exact things to make it seem as realistic as possible. In theater, it is my opinion that uh, most of what is in theater is a suggestion. It's meant to provoke and evoke imagination, but it's not meant to be completely realistic. So for example, when you walk into a theater and you see a set on stage, you know that that is not a functioning piece of architecture. You know that no one lives there on that thing. And yet there's enough of that physical structure to help you as a, as a viewer to imagine the entire environment around them. It's a well, suggestion. That, that's, a, that's a process called the willing suspension of disbelief. Yes, and indeed. And so I use that as a suggestion for the way I handle sound design in theater, which is that 
I'm not necessarily trying to provide the most realistic sounds. What I'm trying to do is provide sound and music that will evoke an emotional response and engage your audience's creative imagination so that they're able to put themselves in the exact emotional and physical state that the people on stage are in. So that's kind of how I look at it. Well, sure. And, and what's interesting about, and I'll ask you this because I think it's very interesting that you do both, the difference between most plays, not musicals now, musicals are a different animal, but right. plays pretty rarely have a score to them. Sometimes they'll have a piece of music or they might have two, but most plays don't have a score, but movies oh. and TV shows are all scored. I think, I think you'd be surprised. And I, I will say this, in the last 15 to 20 years, I think theater has gotten more savvy about using score in a way that they did not used to. I think when we look back at plays from you know, the 30s and 40s, obviously music was very much sort of an ancillary thing, mm -hmm. but really starting with like Tennessee Williams and moving forward from that point, um, I think dramatists have begun to understand um, how music, when it's used in a, you know, really complementary and subtle way can heighten emotions. And so a lot of what work I do is creating underscore very similar to what we do in film. Um, I mean, the big difference to be totally honest with you is that in live theater, it's a different show every night. Right, and sure. And so people change or adjust or do whatever they do um, depending on the night. And so you need to be able to have music that you can cue in a way that is flexible. But in film, the greatest part about film is the performance is the same no matter how many times you watch it. So exactly. when you score a film, you are creating music that can be incredibly detailed. I can literally you know, have a musical flourish on an eyebrow twist if I want, where I can never get away with that in theater. So you want to, so the difference philosophically is one in film scoring, you're trying to create music that is incredibly tailored to the performance exactly. And in theater, you're trying to create music that creates an emotional context and environment by which the performance is flexible to shift and the music is still complimentary and support. So mo most, uh, I, I want to dig down a little deeper here because I think it's interesting. Most movies um, today, especially the big budget movies, yeah. And even the smaller budget movies for that matter, but most most movies and TV shows have very little empty space in the in the background sound. Almost all of them have not only Foley, which is the creation of sounds like you say the key in the lock and footsteps yeah. and so on, but they also tend to be scored throughout. There's a score cued all the way through most movies and TV shows. But are, you're not talking about the same thing in the theater, are you, where it's you, the curtain goes up and it's scored from beginning to end? No, I rarely do I do a fully scored through play, but I do feel like there is definitely moments of underscore, depending on the show, of course. I mean, every show is completely different. Um, but I do think that the sort of theatricality of film in terms of its use of music, um, people people experience that sort of connection in a film and they think maybe there's ways we can use that in theater as well. And a lot of what I do is experimenting with that idea of how we can borrow um, these sort of score ideas from film and, and use them in theater, not from beginning to end, of course, but um, in places where um, theatricality is heightened, where we're in a deeply emotional state mm -hmm. um, and where we're really trying to show as much about what the character is experiencing emotionally as well as what they're experiencing physically in a plot line, for example. Is it, so for instance, in slave play, how much music is in slave play? There's a lot of music in slave play. Um, and the interesting thing about it is that the way slave play is structured um, especially around the music, uh, it is a really unusual thing. There are basically three acts of slave play. In act one, music is kind of this weird, strange force that comes out at very specific moments and sort of 
almost forces the characters on stage to move or act in a certain way in time with that music. It's almost as if the music has control of them. And mm. that is part of that experience of that. And then in act two, there is no music at all. It is completely silent from beginning to end with no music whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And then in act three, um, there is music from the very beginning of the act to the end. It is scored entirely through. And what that music is doing is it's played at such a small level. It is meant to convey the ongoing anxiety that one of the characters in the show is feeling from beginning mm -hmm. to end. The music is representative of that. So the music actually sort of rises and falls in volume and increases in intensity and decreases in intensity based upon how much anxiety they are experiencing at whatever moment in the play. Interesting. Did you design this? You designed the sound for it as well. I did. Yes. I did so you could control sound. that from, from the beginning to the very end, not just in the play, but in the production in, in total. Yes, that's absolutely right. And in fact, I mean, I, I I should say that this was in close collaboration with Robert O'Hara, the director of the play, and sure, Jeremy O'Hara, the playwright. Um, but it, it was it was a, a big experiment, and it took us quite a while to really find exactly how to make it work. Was it written into the play for to indicate that that would happen, or was that something you discovered in process? S yes, most of it is written into the play in terms of what the idea is right. but in terms of how it is functionally used that was definitely the sort of like well we have to see when we get in the theater so, how this works so it's, it's remind me again it's jeremy o'harris right that's correct yeah Jer Jer jeremy o'harris is the playwright and um it's it's clearly indicated in the text music plays under here in some way however that's written it's written that way that is written that way in the stage directions. Yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. All right. I want to talk about the process of getting to that point. So in other words, you're sitting around your house and how does it work? Does someone contact you usually, or are you out hunting for work or how does work come to you? A lot of the times people call, which I'm really grateful for. Sure. I have to say, having, having started in the business as an actor and to go through that sort of audition circuit and constantly putting yourself out there and receiving rejections and then to gradually transfer into a field where people just call up and say like hey would you like to do this um i really like that one version better um, <laughs> well well who wouldn't <laughs> right it's pretty great um so uh, most of the time people call i also try i really try to stay up to date with who are the rising sort of directors and playwrights um, in theater. I think it's really important to support those voices early in their careers. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, I've always made it a point, even though I have been very, very lucky and managed to work in um, sort of high profile projects, I always try to keep one eye open for projects that are, um, uh, you know, less prestigious, but with people who I really admire or who I really think are, um, you know, really exciting people. To You're work seeking with. out talent, not so much the 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 name brand or something like that. You're you're looking toward the future. I think the listeners should really pay attention to uh, what Lindsay's talking about, which I think is a very important factor, and that is this you are keenly at attentive to the marketplace and what's going on you're not just sitting back and waiting for things to flood your way you're actually paying attention to all of it yes yeah absolutely and i mean the reality is theater for the most part is very much a relationship business um it's really about establishing connections with people and then over time working with them, gaining their trust and having them, you know, if you're a freelance person, the, the, the thing you're really looking for is re repeat customers. You know, you're looking for people who say, you know, Lindsay Jones did a great job on my last show. I'd really love him to be on the next show. And sure. sometimes being able to say, Hey, you know, Lindsay Jones came and worked for me for a small amount of money because they believed in me and my talent will be an investment that later on when those people rise up the ladder they'll be say they want to keep their loyalty to me which i'm always very grateful for well of course i mean that's again it's better when they're coming to you rather than you seeking them out and that's what you're talking about you're building 
again, a very important factor here, you're building relationships. And it may not have to do with the product you're working on today. You're looking toward the future and what may come down the road. Yeah, that's absolutely and true. I think there are a lot of artists that don't think that way. I think they think this is today is today's everything, but it isn't. You have to think about the future. Yeah. I mean, I, maybe they're really lucky and really talented and they don't have to worry about that. But for myself, I, I always keep an eye on it. Well, and you're in you're in a business in which uh, you're going to work for a short period of time on any one um, uh, item, any one show or any one movie. You're going to work for a short period of time, whatever that is, whether it's weeks or months, uh, and then you're going to be done. Now you're off looking for another one. So you're always reinventing the wheel. You're free. Absolutely true. Yeah, yeah, freelancers are always reinventing the wheel. So you you can't think to yourself, I'll sit back on my laurels. Uh, and it's not a day to day job. It's it's not a nine to five. You're not punching a clock. It, it, it comes to you as it comes. And uh, you have to take advantage of that and be ready for it when it does come. Um, all right. So what is the uh, you, a project has come your way, uh, whoever it is, whether it's a producer, a director, uh, whoever is coming your way. And they're saying, hey, Lindsay, we want you to work on this. Uh, what is your typical first step? I'm going to assume it's either looking at footage of a finished movie or it's a play. It's the, you're reading the text or maybe in the movie you're reading the script as well. What's the very first step? So in film and theater, they're slightly different. So I'll, I'll, go, I'll go through film first. So sure. in, in film, I don't think anybody has ever handed me a film and said, here it is. Like, the, here's a product of it. Like what normally happens with film is they will contact me before they've shot anything. Mm -hmm. um, and they'll be like, here's the script and I'll have conversations with the director. Um, and then, you know, I will start sort of slowly reading it, trying to imagine music, but I, I try not to um, do a tremendous amount of visualization of music before I see it only because I'm really drawn to the dramatic image, the, well, the actual it, drama. It's hard to find the emotion on the page. Yeah. It's much easier to true. find the emotion once you see the actors emoting. Yes, absolutely. And so, um, so then what happens is they'll go through the process and make the film. And I, I find almost inevitably the amount of time that they have promised me that I will have to work on the movie is a gross over estimation and then <laughs> they will show up at the very last second and be like we're so sorry the here editing it is. took too long we think they're here, like we only, here it is releasing this in a couple of weeks so <laughs> no rush but get this done immediately <laughs> no rush yeah, yeah it's hurry hurry up and wait and then hurry up and yeah a lot of that a lot of hurry up so yeah so most every, of every composer is, every film composer i've talked to has the same it makes the same statement that you're always at the last minute. It's always less time than you think. Uh, it's, a, it's always a jam. Yeah, it is. And you just get used to working in that environment where you just are, um, you're like, uh, you just have to like focus totally on it and just um, pull music out of you. And I think that is difficult for some people to understand that writing music is an emotional experience. Um, it is, it is not, I mean, I think some people just feel like uh, because music is so ubiquitous now, music is literally everywhere. We hear music in every environment we walk into, we hear music in everything we, and so as a result, I think some people believe there's like, just like a music button. We just press that button and the music comes out. There um, isn't. There's not. There is not. Uh, unfortunately, you you can't go down to the music store on the corner and just buy yourself a score. I wish. I wish I could. I would do it all the time. Um, so it there is, you know, actual artistic process in terms of like, okay, what am I trying to say with this music? What are they? What are the characters experiencing in this scene? How do I make get the music to express that? Um, and when you are on a tight deadline. And what inevitably happens is you just have to make decisions and run with it. That's you don't have a whole lot of time to really have any sort of stern and drawing about it. You just who who typically does the spotting of cues? You or someone else ahead of you, or combined? So it depends on the experience. Um, sometimes what happens is I'll sit with the director and we'll talk through the the 
movie together and we'll say, okay, this is where the music is. Or what will also happen is sometimes they'll send me something and say, here is a temp score mm -hmm. that the editor has put in already, replace this score. And that will be sometimes how it gets to me. And then sometimes I will have, I mean, I'm currently working on a project right now actually where the director's like, I think the music is here, but if you hear music in other places, put it in other places too. Are you, does, the, does a temp track throw you in any way? Does it ever force you down a road you may not want to go down? It, a temp track is, it is, it is a blessing and it is a curse. And right. I think it's important to embrace both sides of it. What is a blessing about it is that it is a shorthand for a director or an editor to communicate what emotionally they are looking for from the music in that moment. Mm -hmm, so, sure. So that's helpful because sometimes it's when you talk about music sometimes and talk about the emotional nature of music, that's hard to do uh, sometimes for people. It's hard to be like, I want the music to be sad, but not this sad, but a little sad. You know what I mean? Like, so having a temp score to be like, I like the, I like the emotionality of this feeling of this music. That's helpful when it becomes a curse is when, and this is inevitable, um, you start watching a scene with a tempt piece of music, knowing full well that you're going to replace that music someday, but you listen to it enough times, you become used to that piece of music to right. the point where it starts to feel like that is the music. Right, sure. And, and a lot of directors wind up rejecting whatever the composer brings in because they're so used to the temp track, they decide to keep the temp track. That has totally happened to me. And or what they say is, I can't afford the temp track but can you write a piece of music That's that is exactly like the temp track, <laughs> but different, but just different enough so that <laughs> I won't get sued for it. Yeah. That has also happened. So you also, I assume find yourself once you're looking at a cut, I guess, locked picture at that point, uh, yeah. when you're looking at that cut, you are also locked into the rhythm of that, those images. So if it's very quickly cut, you're, you're not likely to try and counter it, or maybe sometimes you do want to counter it, but the rhythm of however they've edited it has to impact the way that you think about what the music is going to sound like. Yes, that's true. And I think once you have an edited picture in front of you, um, you have to honor what is on the screen. You, mm -hmm. you, you really do. And so if, if, if a something has been cut in a way to a tempo, even if I write a completely new piece of music, I have to honor that tempo because that that's the that's the feel of the picture. And sure. in order for me to support it, I've got to do that. So so yeah, that is that's something even when I'm if if I could convince the director of being like, hey, I know you really love this piece of temp music, but we can't use it. So I have to replace it with something else. When I turn in the piece of music that will replace it, it it's got to match at least tempo wise what's happening or otherwise I'm dead. That's what I mean. You've got, you're sort of, you as a composer are locked into that rhythm, the tempo, whatever it is that's been set by the cut. And if you don't, it's going to sound, it'll probably look and sound weird yeah. or, or it'll actually be grating and not, and not helping uh, the emotion of what you're trying to express. Um, do you have a do you have any preference between writing for movies and stage at all? I know you said you didn't, but is there would if you if I said to you, Lindsay, you can never write for one or the other. Okay, I'm okay with that because I can always do this over here because I like doing this a little more. Or are they really equal? To me, I look at them as related but so different from one each other from one mm -hmm. another it's hard it, it, to me they really are two completely different skills so mm -hmm. that's that's the difficulty in me picking one I mean if I have to pick one I will probably pick the theater because that is the one that I'm the most you know that 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 is my that's the thing I do the most often that's the thing I feel constantly inspired by but I love the challenges of film and I love the experiences of trying to really nail something down in a really exact way that you do with film scoring that you can't do with with theater. So, so yeah, it's a tough choice. For me, you I do you say. you just want to do it all, which I, yeah. I can't can't fault you for in any way, shape, or form. And Thank you. so I I do wonder since you're not a trained um, mus musician, you don't have uh, notation skills. Um, how do you, do you hand it off to someone else to orchestrate it? How do you arrange the music? 
Um, yeah, so it, it depends, right? So a lot of film work for me, I'm being hired on a small to medium budget. So in those cases, um, I'm creating all the music myself. Uh, in so, synthesizers. Yeah, I'm creating it with sample instruments and um, other forms. And I will hire real players um, to supplement that as I can. But when I do that, what happens is I will create demos of those performances, have someone um, transcribe those, those demos, and then that music is given to the player and that's how it works. Um, but a lot of the time I'm really responsible for the music that, you know, I just write it all and that's the, that's the finished product. So you are the composer and the arranger and the orchestrator. You're making all those sounds happen. And even if you bring in supplemental musicians, it is, you're not handing it off to someone else to arrange it for you. Generally, no. I mean, I will say that sometimes um, I ask for help. Uh, it, uh, rarely, but it, it does happen where I'll be like, gosh, I need a vocal arrangement here. And I don't necessarily understand enough about vocal arranging. Um, you know, to get a harmonic structure. And that's when I will go to somebody and say, can you, can you help me turn this melody into a full choral melody? Right, sure. For example. Sure, sure. That makes sense. All right. I, I want to talk for a few minutes about sound design in the theater, which is a um, a related but very different skill set. And you totally clearly have those skill sets as well. And that's a big part of what you do. Um, Tell the audience what the theater would be like today if there was no amplification. Oh my gosh. Well, there'd be a lot of complaints. I have a feeling. <laughs> because people couldn't hear anything. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think mean, a lot of that, happens. correct me if I'm wrong, but I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that we are used to TV and movies and those come at you with big volume usually. And without that volume, the theater suddenly recedes to being very small. It's true. I mean... I don't like to dwell on this a lot because I don't want to make it sound like I'm being critical of today's audiences or to be like, oh, you know, back in the old days, we didn't have any application and everything was great. Sure. But um, I really try to frame it as much as possible in that by integrating sound design into your performances, you have infinitely more possibilities for creative expression and to be able to assist in the clearest and most effective ways of storytelling. And sure. that's really what sound design is for in my book. Now, as in terms of clarity and in terms of making sure that everybody, every single member of that audience, they all get the exact same show that no matter where they sit, they're gonna hear it just as well as if you paid to sit down front of the front row or if you're sitting all the way in the back, you mm -hmm. wanna be able to make sure that everybody has the exact same show and certainly sound design is a big part of that uh, experience um but i i i try not to dwell on the sort of utilitarian nature of sound design because i don't want people to think that that's all it can do it's so much more than that but you're well, right without sound design we would be in big trouble we'd be in big trouble there's no question today um do you think of yourself as a sound designer, as an artist, a craftsman, a technician, all the above? How do you think of yourself in that function? I do think of myself in all three of those things that you've listed. Um, I think of myself as an artist because I'm frequently trying to um, create an emotional context for acting, acting that's happening around that. And what and I'm trying to really think about how to communicate through an artistic expression of sound mm -hmm. in order to, to generate those responses. I think of myself as a craftsman because I have to build each one of those things myself by hand. And I um, spend a tremendous amount of time um, massaging and um, creating things so that it has the exact perfect response that I want for that moment. So I work deeply with that. And then I do consider myself a technician because part of the job is technical. It is about um, managing a tremendous amount of expensive electronic equipment in a way that if I've done my job correctly, by the end of it, 
you will have had this incredible experience that you will be have a complete full sonic picture of, and you will have no idea that I was ever there. You will not know that I did it because if I did my job correctly, the sound will just be in the space. It will feel totally natural and organic in every way. And you'll never stop to think like, oh, that sound came out of that speaker. You'll only think, wow, I really enjoyed that story. It's a, it's integrated. It belongs in the in the whole, which is exactly what it should do. It shouldn't stand out in any way, shape, or form, and should yeah. enhance what's there and make it feel like it's of a whole, of a piece. That's absolutely true. Um, is there some quality that you seek as a sound designer? Is it is it a volume thing? Is it a is it a blending thing? A mixing thing? What quality do you tend to think of the most when you're going into a sound design? That is a great question. Uh, I want to say that I have had over my career moments to sit down and think about my craft and to think about like, well, what, what are the hallmarks of the things that I do? What are the characteristics of my work and what do I really care about? And to me, the most exciting and important thing about theater is the visceral connection between performer and audience and how we can watch a story unfold on stage and audiences can really lose themselves in that story. And that connection between performer and audience, I feel is truly unique to theater and why I honestly believe theater still exists in 2021 is because you can't find that anywhere else. You can't find that in film. And um, so what I do in terms of my own work is I try to create work that is bold, that makes a visceral impact. You know what I mean? When you I do. hear my work, I want you to immediately be excited and energized by it. And most importantly, I want my work to literally like grab you as an audience member and pull you into the show so that you're a hundred percent um enveloped by that story and you forget about everything else other than what's happening on that stage and all of the audio and sonic energy that can help push you emotionally through that story well you know as a composer you're part of the storytelling process do you think of yourself as a sound designer as a storyteller as well absolutely absolutely how so um because audio tells a story in a way that nothing else can. Um, you know, there's a shorthand with audio, even with simple things, right? Like if you and I were to have to convey the idea that we're standing in a field at night for story purposes, all I have to do is pull up a recording of crickets, place it in the room, and within a second, those that sound has established that storytelling aspect we know it's night we know we're in some quiet place where we can only hear these insects and we automatically have an emotional tenor that's dropped on the scene just by using this one cue and so when that is married in combination with lighting and costumes and sets to create that final thing that audio is the thing that tells the story that brings us that moment that allows us to be fully engaged in that. And let's put it this way. If you and I did do a scene that was set at night and we had the lights and we had the sets and we had the costumes, but we didn't have that sound element, it wouldn't be anywhere near as effective because that environment is what places us in that scene, really gives us that grounding we need. Well, one of the uh, hallmarks of lousy uh, uh, film festival movies is crappy sound. That's a hallmark of bad movies that are in film festivals. And it's similar to what you're talking about in the theater, that the sound becomes a part of the, the tapestry of the whole. And without it, you're missing, you're missing a piece. You're missing a color or whatever it would be. It's true. And, you know, I'm going to say something that's probably going to be slightly controversial, but sound design is hard, everybody. Okay, like, here's the <laughs> thing. I just want to say this. Why is that controversial? Is, That's not no, but just, I want to just say this, okay? So if sound design goes wrong, you know it, everyone knows it immediately. There immediately. is no disguising it. If a lighting designer, if, if somehow a lighting cue, like you jump one cue ahead, most people in the audience will think, oh, that's an interesting choice. But they won't be like, aha, 
mistake. <laughs> but if there is sound, if there's anything that goes wrong with the sound, if you hear an, one errant noise or like a squeal of feedback or like something played at the wrong time, your mind, you don't even, it's not even like you're trying to be judgmental. It's just your body instinctively knows that that's wrong. And so as a result, it's a tremendous responsibility to really make sure that it is 100% bulletproof. Because if it isn't, you're absolutely right. The first time you hear that bad sound in a film or in something else, it pulls you completely out of it. And totally then for the rest of, of the time, it's you're done. Totally out of it. Totally yeah. out of it. Well, there, there are any number of elements that do that in a movie or, or in a play for that matter. I mean, in a, in a movie, if you're sitting watching the movie and you're really into it and suddenly the mic dips into frames, in Ugh. the frame, it pulls you right out of it. You're no longer in the movie. So yeah, there's a lot of that. W what would you say, aside from money, are the big differences between creating, a, creating sound for Broadway versus in a regional theater or in a local theater? Uh, are there big differences or is it all the same? It's similar, but it is different. Um, I mean, you have to remember that um, on Broadway, every show that you will see on Broadway is a commercial enterprise. Mm -hmm. Its purpose is to make money. And I'm not saying that that is not the case in a regional setting, but the way regional theaters frequently operate is they operate on a sort of subscription basis. You basically have subscribers for a season. And funders. And funders, exactly. So as a result, they're sort of looking at a long game scenario of like, okay, well, maybe this show didn't do as well, but the next show did great. So it sort of balanced everything out and you can sort of run a business over time based upon an average of how each show does. Whereas in a Broadway production, it is a completely commercial thing. That entity only exists for that particular production. So as a result, all uh, decisions are made around that. And what happens is, is if you're not careful, people can begin to evaluate the art and based upon what they think the financial return will be. Um, you know, like uh, you'll have a producer who will say, um, uh, gosh, um, I find loud stuff exciting. So let's put more loud stuff in the show because more loud stuff means more exciting. And therefore people like more exciting. Yeah. And um, I'm not saying that's exclusively on Broadway or that everyone on, on Broadway operates like that, but there is that mentality that you need to be aware of, which is you want to remain as true to the integrity of the show and the production as you can, but you also need to be able to balance the commercial interests of, you know, the, if the show does not bring in an audience and generate significant funds, it can't, it literally just can't stay on Broadway very long. So you well, make that's, decisions that's the case that. for, that's a case, the case for, a significant number of Broadway shows. And that's well known that uh, most shows do not last a long time on Broadway and really very few plays last a long time on Broadway. Um, I think the last play that ran for a very long time was Tobacco Road, like 90 years ago. Yeah. And, and every other play runs months, maybe a year at the most, and then they're gone. Uh, musicals, however, that's a different animal entirely. Again, they tend to run for, if they're any good, they tend to run for a very long time. H how important is it for you to spend time in a space before you, you even make your design choices? It is really helpful. Um, and I really do try to make sure that I visit the theater before I start working in it um, to get a sense of what the room feels like, um, how I'm going to, because, you know, part of my, the other part of my job is I, I have to also frequently design and specify an entire sound system that will live inside of the space. Right. So, so in addition to, um, you know, going home and creating all of the sound effects, creating all of the music for the show, it's also equally as important that the sound system that all of that stuff will be played back on is to my specifications and is, in my opinion, servicing every single seat of the house the uh, success of my design is entirely based upon how well people can hear it and how well they can perceive it. Um, 
So I do like to spend time in the space, examine the room, listen to how it sounds, see where sound equipment could go, um, and then try and work as best I can. So, to so technically, the technically, there are things you can do uh, not having visited the space. You know how much power is in the space. You know where speakers can actually be put. You know uh, how big a space is, so you know you're going to have a different kind of does need for amplification for a certain reason you're not going to you're not going to put a rock and roll sound system into a 300 seat theater um right. so you you can judge some of those things in advance but you can't really tell anything until you're sitting in the space and hear what the acoustics of the room are like yeah it's then, a big part and of then it. you have a big problem on your hands as well if i understand it correctly is that you will then go into rehearsals and you'll mix and you'll do all those things and suddenly you put a full audience into a large hall and the acoustics change so the mix now has to adjust for uh, the absorption of all those humans in the room and heat and all the rest of it am i correct about that that is absolutely true yes we have this thing in theater called previews and what previews are are essentially performances in which we do a we do a full performance of the show and the audience who comes to see it they play a reduced price and the reason why they're paying a reduced price is we're still working out the mathematics around what works and what doesn't what needs to change and what doesn't before the show is technically open mm -hmm. um, and so those previews are where we are listening very intently and i'm sitting in the house every single night saying okay this this moment worked this moment didn't we have to make these changes and we can only do that by having an audience there in the room to be able to figure that stuff out can, can you describe assuming you have one an especially tricky room that you went into or a hall or whatever it was or theater and what you did to solve the problem with that the acoustics of a certain space Yes, uh, I when I did Bronx Bombers on Broadway at a theater called Circle in the Square. Yes, um, that is a theater that is completely in the round, which means that the stage is in the center of the room mm -hmm. and the audience sits in 360 degree operation around it. And there are not a lot of theaters in America that are in the round. Oh, Many no. of them are mostly proscenium. In other words, they are up on a stage in front of you and you're all sitting in one side of the room. Right. So as a result, uh, in the round really creates a, a, a series of challenges. Basically, you now have to get a sound system that is at least twice as big as you would normally get for a proscenium stage room because the audience is at, on all sides. Um, so, uh, and because Circle in the Square is a large room. Um, and oblong an oblong and it's just a weird space you have to so it's not a true circle in a square it's more of a an, o an a big oval, oval in a square, in a square. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is and we you know we had to put it in there so um so it was it, and i had previously done this show in a sort of proscenium space and then we moved it to broadway and it went into circle and square and it was really like a process to figure different, out different different show wasn't it it was like you were starting 100%. over again. sure yeah and and not just for me i mean for the actors they suddenly have to act in a way so that they are constantly exposing themselves and, and to all the, sides of the room and the lighting designer and the set designer totally absolutely different. yeah completely different so it was basically like starting over with a show that we had already done um but what we wound up doing was getting uh a bunch of speakers that were around the front of the stage that would project out and then we also had sort of speakers that were halfway back to sort of reinforce what they were receiving um, from the front half of the house or the back half of the house had the same amount of reinforcement and it just it was a lot of very careful placement of speakers to make sure that everybody was constantly being received and also miking the actors in a way so that even if an actor has their back to you which they would at, at least one point during the show you will hear their voice as if they are facing you and speaking directly into your face. Sure, sure. Otherwise, you don't hear them. Otherwise, you don't hear them. And, and, and that part of the play is gone. And that for and and it is you're trying to accommodate all the way around, not just straight out, which is totally. 
a, a gigantic difference. Well, yeah. I've been uh, speaking to Lindsay Jones for almost an hour now, um, and it's been just uh, so fascinating to hear uh, his take on how both composing and sound design in the theater work and, and how composing for the movies work as well. And I'm curious, you've obviously been around for a while and you've worked with and met lots of people and you've been through lots of experiences. Um, can you share with us any kind of a story that's either oddball or quirky or offbeat or strange or maybe just plain funny? I'm going to tell the story about how I learned about the nature of collaboration. Oh, um, good. Because I feel like one of the things that I learn in theater is every single day is collaboration is everything and working with other people. The theater is a collaborative art. We can't do it by ourselves. It's a team of people every time. Um, so I was working in Chicago um, and I was working on a play that was written and directed by Larry Kramer. Okay. And Larry Kramer, who is a very successful playwright, he wrote As Is, he wrote uh, The Normal Heart, many successful plays. But, but Larry, in addition to being a, um, a playwright, was also an activist. And, you know, he was part of ACT UP. He was very involved in the AIDS crisis uh, of the 80s and the 90s. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you become an activist, your job as a, as a whole is to argue with people. That's, that's your job. You, know, you have to argue your point and try and get people to understand what you're saying, which is great on an activism point of level. But when you bring that into a theater collaboration, <laughs> that is less productive. Um, yes. And so I, I met him and he, I, I noticed that he was adversarial with virtually everyone within moments of walking into the theater. And I, I just remember over and over again, experiencing people just trying to be like, please let me help you. Please, please let me help you. Please let me help you. So um, we were doing the show and we had gotten to final dress rehearsal and we were running through the show with the actors on stage. There was no audience in the house. It was just those of us working in the show in the house. And um, the actors are on stage. They're about two thirds of the way through act one. And uh, I'm sitting on one side of the theater and Larry is sitting on the other side of the theater. Um, and so the actors are on stage, they're doing their performances. And then all of a sudden I hear Larry and he, he bellows this at the top of his lungs. He says, the sound is ruining the show. <laughs> <laughs> and um the <laughs> actors on stage freeze everyone in the room freezes right like, i can feel like i'm in a, like an ef hutton commercial like where everything stops right <laughs> and everyone looks at me and i wished that the ground would swallow me up whole but it does not and so eventually everybody unfreezes <laughs> and goes back to the show and they keep going forward and i think well i better go deal with this so i get up I walk over to the other side of the theater where Larry is sitting and I say, hi, uh, I hear the show is ruined. And uh, he said, well, this thing is wrong. And I said, okay, I can fix that. And he said, and, and this thing is wrong too. And I said, all right, I'll take care of that. And he said, and, and this last thing was late. And I said, okay, I will, I will have the stage manager call it at an earlier time. If I fix those three things, is the show still ruined? And he said, well, no, I guess not. And I said, okay, why, why don't I go fix those three things? So I go and I fix those things and we get through the rest of the process and we, uh, we get to opening night and on opening night, we're in the lobby at the opening night party after the show. And he comes up to me and says, you're my favorite sound designer. And I said, really? Uh, re why do you feel that way? And he said, well, everybody else just yells at me all the time. And I said, well, you know, maybe you shouldn't, you know, yell at them. Maybe they wouldn't yell back at you if you yelled, if you didn't yell at them so much. And he went, me? I don't yell at anybody. <laughs> and that's when I realized, like, he wasn't necessarily trying to be demoralizing to me or to embarrass me. That was just his way of communicating. Absolutely. And because I was willing to sort of like let go of the emotional container that this information was coming in and just take the three notes and fix them. That's how I gained his trust. And that's how I became his favorite sound designer um, for however long that lasted. But 
So I think that's a really important part of collaboration is, is that sometime if you can, especially when you're working with people who are, would be considered to be difficult, let's just say, um, it's important to do your best to uh, take away any sort of emotional packaging that the notes come in and just focus on the notes themselves. And if you can do that, you can find a way to connect with that person, collaborate and gain their trust. I was just gonna say, I have this saying that I now say that is my thing, my, this is sort of my mantra that I say all the time, which is the definition of collaboration changes every day and it's up to you to figure out what today's definition is. And oh, that well, is how I approach every day. That's, that's very, very good. Um, you know, the mark of a professional is to just take care of the problem. Uh, and, the, and it's interesting, the, the dichotomy between you're actually trying to express, as we've talked about already in the show, emotion on stage that's expressed for the audience to absorb in one way, shape, or form. But the work that goes into making that emotion should be somewhat professional and, and I don't want to say passion less, but it is got to be straightforward and not filled with passion or you'll, you'll be at each other's throats all the time. And well. that won't, that won't work, especially when you're trying to create a show and, and putting those things on are daunting to begin with, no matter what you're doing. It's uh, absolutely true. It's no, it's no way to live too. You got to protect yourself emotionally in order to do this or otherwise you'll be a nervous wreck. Could not agree with you more. You've got to protect yourself <laughs> for sure. All right. Last question for you, uh, Lindsay. Um, what's the best piece of advice that you can give to someone who is um, maybe just starting out and, and trying to figure their way into the business or maybe someone who's in a little bit, but trying to get to the next level? So the thing that has taken me the longest time to learn, and I think it's still a thing I try to learn every day, and I think it's something I can pass along to other people, is that I, I like to consider myself to be a really straightforward person, right? So mm -hmm. if you ask me a question and you say, is this possible? I, uh, 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 you know, for a long time, I would answer honestly. And sometimes that answer would be no. And uh what I found over time is that people really resented if I, somebody said, is this possible? And I said, no, that, that, that just people, I would get in trouble all the time, even though I was trying to be sincere and honest and not negative. And so what I realized was, A, it's an alienating thing that uh, to say no, that is difficult for people to receive in some way. But also the other thing is, even though I'm answering honestly in the moment, if I thought about it after the fact, I might come up with some ideas that I wouldn't have thought of in that moment. So what I have learned over time is when people say to me, is this possible? What I now have trained myself to do, and I want to encourage everyone who hears this to do the same thing. If you are asked a question that you don't know the answer to completely, or you don't think you know the answer to completely, the most important thing is to say, you know what? Can I have some time to work on this? Let me research it and I'll get back to you. And so what that does is it gives you the ability to go away, see if you can think of a solution to the problem and figure out a way to solve it. And then you can come back and be like, okay, here's the answer. Or you might be able to come up with a compromise and say, I can't do this, but I can do this and see if they're open to that. Or you might come back to them and say, you know what? I have put a tremendous amount of thought and effort into this. And I'm so sorry, I can't solve this problem. I wish I could, but I can't. And in all three of those answers that you bring back to that person, they will respect and appreciate you because you took the time and the effort to do your best to make it happen. And they're much more willing to live with whatever gradient of no that is rather than you saying no on the spot. So well, that's my advice. What solid and sound advice that is. Uh, there's no question. And by saying, yes, I can solve that problem if you don't know whether you can solve it or not. If you right. know you can solve it, solve it. If you don't know whether you can solve it or not, by saying yes, you've put yourself in a, in a bit of a trap if you can't solve it. Right. And if you say no, you just look like an obstacle and and they're not appreciating the obstacle. So you're, that advice to say, let me go out and think about this a little bit so I can figure out whether I can do this or not. That's very sound, solid advice. Lindsay Jones, this has been a terrific hour. I can't thank you enough for joining me on Storybeat today. And, and you know, I, I hope someday we get a chance to, to meet in person. And I can hear some of your work live. I would love that. That'd be great. Thank you so much for having me. This has been so much fun and I really appreciate you having me. Oh, it's been my pleasure. And now as promised, we have a real treat. 
Please sit back and enjoy Lindsay's beautiful and haunting music from the Tony nominated play, Slave Play. And so we've come to the end of today's story beat. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a rating or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great story beat episodes to you. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.